Gracious Father, your word tells us at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. At the name of Jesus, everyone will declare him Lord. Father, we know that there is no greater name than the name of Jesus. So, Father, I pray for us today that the words you have for us would be your words alone. They would not be my words or my thought, but just the exactly what you need us to hear. Father, as we pour a solid foundation for the next five weeks of hard teaching, of challenging teaching, we know that it can't be done if you do not lay a foundation in our lives today. So, Father, thank you for the worship of this, your church, that sets the stage for the penetration of our hearts. And we pray it in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. Hey, as we sit, can we thank the band this morning? And Evan and what a great job they did. All right, so we got a lot of wood to chop, so don't look at your watch. Let's just go to work, right? So here's the whole deal. We all have expectations for life, for our relationships, for our future vocations, for retirement, for our children and our grandchildren. Right? We all have these things, these expectations. Every morning, you and I arise in the day with immediate expectations for the day and what we hope to get out of it. Right? We get out of bed and we have expectations before our feet even hit the floor and what we hope we get out of that day, meaning that there is potential disappointment that lurks around every corner. Right? There's just a potential, dis potential disappointment to let us down that our expectations would not be met. I have found in this world, no one is agenda free. There's a little narcissist in all of us, right? We all want what we want when we want it, right? That's just the truth. And while our expectations can range from realistic possibilities to pure fantasy and everything in between, most of the time our expectations go unmet. And this can mess us up. This can cause us to be confused, about who God is and what God wants for us. We just kind of go through this weird time. It messes us up. There are some things in life that we want to believe in and to believe for, regardless of what the reality might be, right? There's some things that we want to believe in, regardless of what our current reality might be. So I'm going to share a couple of examples. They're all personal out of my own life. Uh, our oldest son, Kyle, grew up as a Gator fan under the Steve Spurrier coaching era. So not all of you would appreciate what that means, but some of you in the room know that's a big honking deal. So Kyle was born shortly after Coach Spurrier became coach. So all Kyle ever knew of his beloved Gators was that they won all the time. And they won big all the time, right? He didn't have to live like his dad did through an 0-10-1 season where our own fans threw oranges at us. He didn't, he didn't have to live through that. He never had to utter the words that his father uttered. Wait till next year. Just wait till next year. We're going to be better. I just sense one day we're going to be better. During his young life, he saw the Spurrier-led Gators go to two national championships, win six SEC championships, appear in a bowl game every year that Spurrier was coached, and produce a Heisman Trophy winning Christian hero named Danny Werfel. Woo! <laughs> Jesus be praised. All Kyle had ever known was winning and an incredibly high standard of sports excellence. It was his expectation, right? So I'll never forget the day that Spurrier announced his retirement from Florida to take the job with the Redskins in Washington. We were driving to a soccer weekend. So we were driving, I was driving a soccer van uh, with our boys in the back. We were going to spend all weekend over in Kissimmee somewhere playing a, playing a soccer tournament, which is what we did back in the day. Kyle was on a travel team. And, and so we're driving over there, and the announcement comes over the radio. And, and, and it, just was, it was just kind of weird. Truth be told, everybody in the van was a little bit shocked. But a few minutes later, Kyle's youngest brother, Chris, gives him up and shouts from the back, Dad, Kyle is crying. <laughs> and I said, so is his mother, but they will be fine. They will be fine. She's crying as well. So I, you know, I said in my best comforting dad voice, son, son, what, what is wrong? And he cried out like exiles in the wilderness from the inner core being of his soul, cried out, how could he do this to us? How could, he, how could he leave us when things were so good? It will never, ever be the same. 
That was a bit prophetic. <laughs> we didn't know, we didn't know at the time, you know, we kind of passed it off as no big deal. He was inconsolable that weekend. You remember that, Dee? If he wasn't playing soccer, he was crying and complaining, right, about what was happening in Gainesville. Whatever joy looks like to an 11-year-old, it was stolen. It was stolen. He had no joy. His expectations were dashed, right? And sure enough, Florida hasn't had an 11-year run like that since. The things of this world, here's the point. The things of this world we believe as true and permanent often never are. Often never are. When I first started in ministry, I graduated in May, was ordained in June, and was appointed to a church here in our community. And one of the very first sermons I ever preached was Father's Day, because I learned very early on that that's what happens in the Methodist church, that, that if you're the junior associate, you get dumped all the holiday sermons. Right, so I swore I would never do that to Nathan or Janice, or that I wouldn't make them do all that. So I'm going to preach Mother's Day in a few weeks, and we are going to have Tony do Father's Day, but mostly because I'll be out of town. So here's the deal: I preach Father's Day, and I preach what I think everybody ought to preach on Father's Day. I preach the powerful story of the prodigal son and the fact that the father runs to his son, that his love drives him into an unorthodox, holy sprint to embrace his son. It was the first time that I had ever been transparent about what a crummy dad I had and how Father's Day had become a reminder to me that my heavenly father had overcome the shortcomings of my earthly father. It was the first time that I had ever just kind of put that out there and said, listen, my dad sucks. No other way around it. It was just kind of really transparent about it. On the front row that morning was a young girl whose dad had recently abandoned her and her sister about two years back. And so as I'm preaching this story, she's right here, and she begins to cry, and then I begin to cry. It's a bad start to my preaching career. The truth is, is in that moment, she wasn't having any of it. I could see in her eyes that she didn't want to hear about a God as a loving, caring father who runs to his rebellious kids, much less abandons his good kids. And what could only have been a Holy Spirit moment of inspiration, I went off script and I blurted out, the story sounds so redeeming, unless, of course, you've had a terrible father, right? Her expectations did not line up with her reality any more than mine had. You see, what I know personally is that deep down inside all of us, or at least we, we know, or at least we think we know, what a good, good father looks like. So when it doesn't happen in our life, it's really hard to put your hope and your trust and into your faith in anybody whose title is father. It's just as hard. I think all of us have this innate need to be loved. We all want to believe we have a father who will run to us. And in that moment, in that moment on that Sunday morning, our mutual pain connected us in a relationship that is sealed to this day. I would later get to officiate her wedding to a really, really good man. And I would eventually get to baptize her children as the good, good man loved her and stood beside her. God allowed me to show her that our Heavenly Father does not abandon or run away or betray, but actually pursues us unconditionally. She would later share with me that Father's Day for her had become like Father's Day for me. That it was a reminder that she had a good, good father in heaven and that there were godly men on this earth who would come and stand with you when the men who were supposed to stand with you did not. Men who would actually love sacrificially and unconditionally. Honestly, this early experience drove me to be even more committed to working with young people and groups like FCA have been important to me. It's part of the reason that I'm a dad, a room dad at Cambridge because I know that there are the fatherless in our community who desperately know that they need to know that there are good, good fathers on earth who will love them unconditionally. You see, there are absolutes we all want to believe in, and we all want to believe that our dad is there for us. We think that's one of those core values. But then when it doesn't happen, it messes us up. Last example. 
Dee Dee and I were married in December of a year, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I'm not going to give you the year. Our, our young people will be like, whoa, he's so old. So anyway, um, we were married in December. Six months later, both our parents had either separated or divorced. The term adult children of divorce is a real thing. That's a real thing, right? So uh, it rocked our world because what we trusted, what had shaped us for marriage was gone. Actually, it had been a mirage, right? It had been kind of, a, kind of an illusion. It, it really wasn't real. Uh, Dee Dee and I were some of the first in our friend group to get married. And so we had no examples of what marriage was supposed to look like. I personally thought it would look like Eden, right? You know that, no clothes on, an endless buffet. That's what I thought. I thought, how much better could this be? Right? I look in the Bible, no clothes on, all the food you want. I thought, this, this is heaven. Dee Dee saw it a little bit more pragmatically, to be honest. Anyway, anyway, we have that first big blow up. If you've been married, you know you all have that one fight, that one big thing that just, wow, just blows the whole thing up. It was a really bad fight. It was a really bad day. I can't remember what it was about. But I bet Dee Dee can, so you need to check with her later. So Dee Dee's not a scorekeeper. She doesn't remember that kind of stuff. Anyway, at, the, at that time in my life, I have no accountability partners. I have no mentors. I don't have anybody. We're new in Melbourne. We had been here about eight months, and so and it's just kind of weird. And so I did what every self-respecting, newly married man who has no father figure in his life would do. I called my mommy. <laughs> I gave her a call. Now, so you know how ridiculous this is and was. This is way, 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 way before cell phones. There's no, no such thing as even a portable phone, right? We're living in a thousand square foot rental home in Palm Bay. So I have to take the phone, stretch the cord into the closet, close the door of the closet and whisper, whisper when I call her, right? I mean, because it was a, such a small house that if you whispered in the kitchen, you could hear that person talking while taking a shower in the bathroom. I'm just telling you it was that small. As I started, in on my wounded feelings and how my new bride was not treating me fairly or kindly or any of those compassionate words that you might use, my mom stops me mid-sentence. We're not 30 seconds into this and said, whatever you did, go out and apologize. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't think you understand. I don't, I don't think you're hearing me. I don't think I'm making myself clear. And she says, oh, I understand. Whatever you did, go apologize. Have a nice day. And she hung up. She hung up on me. Shut the front door. She hung up on me. My father didn't love me. Now my mom hung up on me. I'm so messed up, I didn't know what to do, right? Here's the deal. Here's the deal. No one stands at the altar and says, I do, and ever expects there to be bad days. No matter what you've been told, no matter what you've been warmed, no matter what you hoped for, no matter what your expectations were, nakedness and nachos is not a thing. <laughs> not a thing. There is no such thing as marital paradise. Just two sinners working to love each other like Jesus every day. By the way, I walked out and I apologized. Right? This is what it looks like. Here's the deal. We have things we want to believe, but we're so challenged by assumed truth, and filled with moments of doubt. The fact is, church, that our spiritual life is not immune to the challenges of what we want to believe and what reality might be, right? There's these things we want to believe, and then there's a reality that is. So I want to share a story that comes from the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9. You can go there if you want. It's a long story. You might find it by the time I finish it, but um, we'll go there. I'm going to share this story because I think it sets the stage. We didn't put it on the screen because, honestly... I decided to use it after Luis had done his work, and I didn't want to abuse him. So Mark, Mark chapter 9, verse 14, it says, uh, When they came with the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teacher of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, Jesus asked. The man of the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. And Jesus says, you unbelieving generation, how long shall I have to stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. 
So they brought him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion, and he fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming in the mouth. So you just need to picture that. The boy's on the ground, foaming in the mouth, spinning like a top. God only knows what that looks like. Lots of commotion. And then Jesus asked the boy's father, important question, how long has he been like this? All right? We're going to come back to that. From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or the water to kill him, but if you can do anything... Take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the pure spirit. You deaf mute spirit, he said, I command you to come out of him and most importantly, never to go back into him again. And the spirit shrieked, convulsed and violently came out and the boy looked. So much like a corpse that many said he was dead, but Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. I think this is the tension we all feel, honestly. We believe, but please, dear, dear God, help me. Help me with my unbelief. In other words, we want to believe, but we are bombarded with peace-robbing doubts. You know, listen, it's easy to have faith when everything's going well. It's easy to celebrate, oh, Jesus is good when everything's up and to the right. The the, the truth of the matter is that eventually all our faith gets tested, right? It's what the Bible says, that we get refined by fire, that iron sharpens iron. The kingdom is never advanced with lazy boy theology and marshmallow fluff. It just does not happen. If we're not careful, we can develop a lazy faith that wants to look for the wide road of the world, a road that avoids risk-taking, a road that avoids emotional vulnerability. The question in this story that I love so much, and I saw it for the first time this week that I think is so cool, Jesus asked the father, how long has he been this way? Keep in mind, the boy's doing circles on the ground, foaming at the mouth, and Jesus wants to take a history and physical. He wants to ask the question, so how long has he had these symptoms? Right? I mean, you look at him, he's spinning like a top. Come on, Jesus, savior of the world, right? It's a ridiculous question compared to the needed outcome. It's an unnecessary question at hand. Who cares how long it's been going on? The only thing that matters is fix this. What a stupid question. Just do something about it. But the question gets asked because it reflects that God deeply cares about all of human brokenness. Jesus didn't need to know the duration of the condition to heal the boy. He asked because he cared, and don't miss this. He asked because he knew that the boy wasn't the only one who was suffering. The boy wasn't the only one who was suffering. He knew his loving parents were suffering as well because there is nothing more hopeless than feeling helpless in caring for your children or the people you love. So Jesus doesn't ask because he didn't have a solution. Jesus asked because he cares, right? The question reveals the nature of God who sees it all. Now, clearly, this man had some kind of faith. After all, he brings his boy to Jesus. But let's be honest. It might be more desperation than faith. But he comes with hopeful expectation, right? He believes even as doubt swirls around him that this might be the answer, right? Again, don't miss this in this story. Maybe it's the failure of the disciples to heal the boy that allows the seeds of doubt to be planted in the father's heart about whether Jesus can do anything. Right? Maybe it's the disciples that caused this problem. What if we do this? What if we do this? What if we plant seeds of doubt in people's life? through our negativity and our pessimism and our, and our anger and our, and our lack of trust and our lack of faith and our lack of, What if we walk around and just plant seeds of doubt in people's life when what God has called us to do is to plant seeds of hope? What if we're like the disciples? And then we find this father's cautious, fragile belief captured in three words. He says to Jesus, if you can, if you can, now, you got to love Jesus' response, right? The quirky version of this is like, seriously? Seriously, are you, are you kidding me? If I can, if I can, I can. The question is, will I? Not if I can, but should I? 
Could I? Will I? That's the question. Then he reminds us all that even at seasons of our greatest doubts, he says to them, everything is possible. Possible for the one who believes. Now, to be clear, I do not believe that all doubt is bad because I, doubt, I believe that some doubt drives the need for faith. I believe that doubt is the curable disease of the enemy that is transmitted by fear and faith is secure. Faith is the assertion of a divine possibility against all earthly probabilities. Faith is the hope we have in spite of past experiences and current circumstances. The fact is, is the helpless father speaks what most of us feel with complete and transparent honesty. I believe, but will you help me with my unbelief? You see, we all want to believe, but we live in this messy mixture of belief and unbelief. Listen, I am confident in my faith. I am sure of my salvation, but I am not immune to visitations of doubt. Not immune to visitations of doubt. I had them as recently as 10 days ago, three days before Easter. They usually come for me in the middle of the night, what I call voices in the dark. You see, it's in the dark when doubt likes to visit us. It's in the dark when there's no hope of light coming that the, that the enemy wants to plant seeds of doubt. It's in the dark that we question our faith and trust in God. It's why the book of John starts the way it does and so adamant that the light has come to repel the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it, Jesus says. That we are children of light, rendering darkness, darkness powerless. Have you ever noticed that it takes the smallest amount of doubt to derail your life? Just the slightest hint that things are not as we expect them to be can tank your confidence in what you believe. I mean, it just takes, just takes a little bit, right? Maybe this is why Jesus tells us that we have to have faith as small as a mustard seed and we can do anything. Maybe it is a little bit of faith like a mustard seed that overcomes the greatest amounts of doubts. Church, I find that doubt leads to worry and worry leads to fear and fear leads to inaction. Faith, on the other hand, eliminates worry, crushes fear, and always leads to action. Faith is letting go in confidence that God will never drop you, that he always has you, and that he refuses, that he refuses to let you go. Here's why this matters. In 1 Peter 3, the disciple who knew a little bit about doubts and a stumbling faith writes these words. He said, we must be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks us for the reason for the hope we have. Do you suppose as Peter's penning these words that he's thinking about that night just outside the temple in the courtyard when he was asked if he was part of the Jesus followers and realized how unprepared he was for that question and how miserably he failed? Do you suppose as he writes these words, he's trying to say to us, listen, I was there. I knew what it was like to be unprepared. You should be prepared at all times to give a reason for the hope you have. Faith stands for the radical interruption of the vicious chain of interlocking dependence leading to chaos. That was good. Some of you are going to write that down. Faith stands for the radical interruption of the vicious chain of interlocking dependencies leading to chaos and then discovering a peace within. Believing in faith points to a new way of speaking, a new way of breathing, a new way of being together, a new way of trusting, a new way of living that drives out fear and uncertainty that we preached about last week. Believing is fragile, fragile, fragile. It's the on again, off again. Some days spiritually confident and strong, other days inwardly unsure and insecure. It, it's been my experience in my Christian walk. There are three types of believing. We're going to unpack them really quickly and then move on to the concept of today. I've experienced all of these spectrums of faith. The first kind of faith is what I call a casual believer. Such a person believes in God but hasn't fully surrendered to him. They may have be, have be church attenders. They're possibly even moral good people. Even though the person believes in God, they live their life as if God doesn't exist. What we would call a dissenting theist or a practical atheist. Casual believers can pray a polite prayer at Thanksgiving, attend church at Christmas and Easter, and they will even tell you that they will pray for you while you're going through some struggles but walk away with never intending to pray for you. Right? But they know, they know how to say it. Casual Christians never let God affect their spending habits, their recreational time, stretching of the truth, participating in gossip, or fudging on their taxes. They believe in God, but they still pretty much do whatever they want to do. That's a casual Christian. And then there's this convenient believer. This is the one who happily leverages Christianity when it's beneficial. They know how to talk the God talk. 
They know the right language. They know all the right words. They know it so well they can get the deal done. They can score a promotion. They may even get a hot date with the right language, right? God becomes just one of many tools in their toolbox to get what they want. God becomes a vending machine, a personal gain. I hear our college kids talk about it all the time. Believer, these kind of convenient believers in a Bible study one night so they can be seen by others, but denying God the next night in a drunken stupor, living side by side. I think all of heaven shudders in horror that we have this infinitely valuable, infinitely deep, infinitely rich, infinitely wise, infinitely loving God. And instead of pursuing him with steadfast passion and an undivided heart, instead of worshiping him with everything we have, instead of attributing to him glory and honor and praise, instead of acknowledging his unlimited power and wisdom and strength, we just try to take his toys and go home. Right? Just kind of pluck the best benefits. The third type of faith belongs to a committed believer. It's what I hope we are all pursuing. The road of committed faith is not a prosperity gospel, but one of sacrifice and self-denial. The committed believer is not influenced by the crowd. They are marked by obedience and content in all things. They are sold out, all in, fully devoted. These are kingdom first kind of people. My greatest fear has never been failure. I fail at tons of stuff. I just don't want to succeed at things that don't matter. I don't want to succeed in anything that's not advancing the the ball up the field. I don't want to succeed in anything that's not repelling darkness. I don't want to succeed in anything that's just going to leave the world the same as I found it. Listen, these three categories are very real. The casual believer believes in God, but doesn't let their faith dominate their life. The convenient believer living right when someone's watching or leveraging Jesus for their benefit, but doing their own thing when they want. And then there's the committed believer who's being leveraged by God to make an eternal difference in the life of another human being who believes that even, don't miss this, that believes that even in the darkest moment, God is about to shine. That even when it's the darkest, God's about to light the room up. This is what we will be talking about for the next five weeks, this kind of belief system. So here's the point today, and I'll I'll see if I can get to this quickly. I think most Christians want to believe the church is a safe place. The fact is it has not always been a safe place. The North American church has a reputation for friendly fire. Friendly fire. There is actually a thing known as a pastor eating church, right? A pastor eating church that devours and spits pastors out. Like they go there for a year and the church is so hard on them, they quit and they move on. And imagine that, that we have a phrase in Christendom called pastor eating churches. I think it would take too long to devour me. (laughs) I think I'm all gristle anyway, right? I could just gnaw for a week. He won't go away. You know, I think, I mean, it's, I'm like an all week buffet. You might have to pack a lunch to come devour me. I mean, this is, I mean, why is this is even a thing? How can this even be a thing in Christendom, right? When Didi and I were talking a couple of weeks ago, just kind of walking and thinking. And, and when, I, when I think about the greatest hurts, the greatest betrayals, those times when I've been maligned the most or stabbed in the back, you need to know they've all come from the church. They've all come from the church. Nothing prepared me for, being, for it being open season on the shepherd all the time. Or that some of the sheep have sharp teeth. Or that some really are not sheep, but really are wolves walking among us, acting like sheep so they can destroy the whole flock. I've always had this pastoral philosophy of do no harm. That's been my heart from the moment God called me is to do no harm. Now, I want to be really clear. I don't want you to have any illusions that I've not said the wrong thing, that I've not said something hurtful, that I've not said something that I wish I had taken back, could take back. I, I've had some of those moments, but my goal always is to do no harm. I'm also keenly aware that each week God speaks to me. I write, and then whoever it is, Janice, Nathan, you know, Tony, whoever gets up here to preach, they get up here and they preach God's word as God has burdened their heart with it. I know God's intent. I know my heart. But I cannot control how 700 people hears what God says through me. I can't control what you hear through your pain and your hurt and your life situation, right? I know that each Sunday I want all of us to be convicted but not condemned. I want us challenged but not chastised. I want the truth of God's word to always, without fail, fall where it needs to fall. 
over the last 20 years, I've come to understand that it's just far easier to shoot the messenger than to blame the guy who's responsible for your salvation of sending his one and only son to die specifically for your sin. It's just easier to shoot the messenger because I don't want to risk my salvation over being mad, but I'll shoot the shepherd in a heartbeat, right? Listen, I want to be consistent in loving unconditionally without compromising God's word or losing sight of the vision of our church. I am crystal clear that God has not called me to bless our sin or reward our bad behavior or to ignore spiritual complacency, but to be, cl- but to be totally clear, he has also called me not to abandon anyone. I will not walk out of your life no matter how bad things are. I will be here at 3925 South Tropical Trail until God calls me home or until God moves me. I will not walk out on your life. I believe that the gospel is inclusive, that it is available for everyone, but it is exclusive in the sense that we must come to Jesus only on his terms. And this is what makes hearing the gospel hard for us is because we got to come on his terms. The bottom line is I believe the local church should be a safe place to create dangerous disciples. The church should be a hospital for the spiritually wounded. I believe the church should be a safe place to find help, hope, and healing. I want this to be a place where there is no judgment, where we can come as we are, where we can come and be genuine and authentic just as we are. I actually believe that God can take our biggest messes and turn it into the greatest messages. I think it is in here where God works that hope out in all of us. I know plenty of people who've come to Georgiana because we have a reputation for loving one another well and loving our community unconditionally, generously, and abundantly. The problem sometimes for the American church As we go and be fishers of men, you remember that part in the Bible where Jesus calls us to be fishers of men? Nod your head if you're with me, right? Right. The problem for us as the church is we want the fish to show up pre-cleaned. Right? We want them to come through the door with their baggage already handled, their sins already dealt with. We'd rather have pre-cleaned Christians and fish in here than ones that are messy and sticky and dirty. Oh, oh, that's okay. We hired a staff to handle that. I don't have to get involved. We've got pastors that will handle that. They'll get dirty. They'll get messy, right? We'd rather have our fish pre-cleaned. The fact is, is we are all sinners, saved by grace. And if church needs to be safe for you and me, then it's got to be safe for everyone. I'm more sure than ever that the church needs to be a safe place for sinners, but not a safe place for sin. Let that sink in. It needs to be a safe place for sinners, but not a safe place for sin. And this is where the tension lies. It's hard not to personalize that because sin always attaches itself individually. This is why people get frustrated when God preaches the gospel to us. Because while it is a safe place for sinners in here, it's never going to be a safe place for sin. Because God says that's what got you in trouble in the first place. Let me just read a few words from Psalm 46. I'm just going to read a couple. It says, God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and the foam and the mountains quake with their surging. It says, God is our refuge and our strength. I'm convinced that the local church should be a fortress, a refuge, a sanctuary, a safe harbor, a place where the toxic things of this world cannot reach us. When I picture our church, I picture high ramparts and thick walls, right, that keeps all that evil and all that ugliness outside. I believe the local church is a mission outpost, not a monastery. We come in here to find rest, and then we go out in war against evil and justice out there. That's why I heart so often on unity in here, because I believe that when we do things together, when we become knit together, when nothing can separate us, when nothing can infiltrate us, there is nothing we can't do. A fortress is a place where genuine love says, I have seen the ugly side of you, and I'm going to stay anyway. A fortress is a place where we can come in the storms of life, a place that is that is there for us when we stumble and fall and when we screw up. Church, we can come to God as we are because we know that our acceptance before God has not ever been predicated on our behavior, but on the righteous life of Jesus Christ. Church should be a place where we find hope for our souls and healing for our hearts. But to be clear, no one is intended to be a perpetual patient in this room. You can't come here and just be a patient for the rest of your life. God wants to do a good work in you and then send you back out there to go help rescue others. The church must be now and always a place that welcomes us, takes us in, nourishes us, and gives us a home. Don't you want to be that kind of church? I know I want to be that kind of church. 
So it requires all of us to be the kind of Christians, a hospitable Christian, a Christian who is on the lookout for tired travelers, and a Christian who seeks to show honor to those who are fighting the battles against the unmet expectations of the disappointment of this world. God anticipated that we would need a safe place, a refuge. Listen to what he says. Psalm 91 says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say the Lord is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Psalm 18 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Psalm 71 says, In you, Lord, I have taken my refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock and my refuge to which I can always go. Give the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O God, from the hand of the wicked and the grasp of those who are evil and cruel. Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters and he refreshes my soul. And Galatians 6 says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let's do good to all people, especially those who belong to the household of faith. They said, God knew that you needed a fortress. Listen, the world is a cruel, cruel place, and we should agree that it should never be a cruel place in here. It should be a place to find rest for the weary. I want to believe that the church is a safe place, but it's only as safe as the love we extend and the care with which we extend it to one another. Louise, y'all can come. We'll wrap things up. Church, what we believe matters because it shapes the magnitude of our faith. In here, I want us to find the faith and courage to keep going, to be equipped for the battle that wages for the souls of every man and woman in this world. I want us to keep believing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father. I want us to keep fighting back the temptations of the world. I want us to not lose perspective on what matters most in life. I want us uh, to not be, I want us to be unhindered from the anxiety that riddles us. I want us to be unchained from institutional religion. I want us to be unleashed from the lies of this world that wants you to believe that you do not matter. I want us to get untangled from our unbelief in the dark nights of our souls. I want us to run the race to win it. To win it. To get to the finish line and hear the words, job well done, good and faithful servant, because you were a person of great belief. I firmly believe this can only happen if this is a safe place, a place to get our bearings, to resupply our spirits, and to rest from the pace of this world. I want this to be a safe place for our kids to know and experience that God's love is incomparable. I want our youth to be armed with the word of God as they take their first steps into the faith of this cruel world that would want them to not believe in that book. I want the marginalized in our community to know we see them we see you, we know you're out there, and we're mobilizing to help you. I want our daughters in Haiti to know that unlike whoever had them before, we will never, ever abandon them. And I want to believe that in the name of Jesus Christ, that there is nothing that we couldn't do together. Amen. Immeasurably more than we could ever imagine if we would just place our hearts in the hand of the one who does all things. I want to believe that Georgiana is that kind of place. And all God's children said, Amen. let's stand and sing. Amen. Our God is able. Amen. Amen. It's, a, it's been a tumultuous couple of years in our denomination. Uh, for anybody who's followed that, it's been really hard on Didi and I as we've dealt with all this uncertainty and all this garbage with the denomination. Um, but in that process, Dee Dee and I have had lots of conversations uh, about our future and our ministry and our life. And, and here's what you need to know. We, we love it here. I mean, I, I, 15 years ago, I started every sermon. Some of you have been in the room, were there that day. I end every sermon the same way every week. I tell you, I love you and I'll see you next week. That's not pastor talk. <laughs> I didn't learn that in seminary. Hey, tell them you love them on the way out the door just in case they forget, you know, right? I mean, that's it's like genuine, right, from, from our heart, Didi and our heart. You know, when we, when we think about this place, we love this church, and we love the people in this church, and we want to do ministry with the people in this church. We're, I'm getting a new boss in, in about two months, a new DS, and 
Uh, it was kind of funny. She asked me, she says, well, what do you and Georgiana need? And I said, to leave us the heck alone. <laughs> I said, Lord. I said, man, you want your life to go well? Don't move me. <laughs> Listen, I hope, I hope and pray that the day that I no longer can this do this job, that the elders will love me enough to say, all right, your time is done. But until then, until then, we love it here. We love y'all. Here's what I believe. I believe we're supposed to be a city on the hill. But I believe we've got to retake the hill. Right? I believe that we lost the hill. Our sole purpose as a church is to retake that hill so we can be a city on the hill. And here's the deal. I want to take that hill with you. I want to lead us up that hill so that we can be a light for Jesus Christ in our community and retake the hill and push back evil. I don't want to do it with anybody else. So when I say I love you, that's the real deal. So I love you and have a great week. <laughs>